I'd like to open with a prayer that I wrote as an invocation for my new book, Wild Mercy, Living the Fierce and Tender Wisdom of the Women Mystics. And this prayer is, uh, I wrote it for my own courage and, and um, yeah, as an invocation, and I offer it to you and see if it can be your prayer too. But first I'd like to say Shabbat Shalom. Today is the holiest of all holy days in the Jewish tradition, and it happens every week. Every week we have this opportunity to lay down our burdens, mostly the burden of thinking that we know and that we're in charge of the universe. It's a very, for me, it's a, an invitation into non-dual practice at its very best because it's about taking a break from doing and dropping into being for, for this period. Um, and I think some of you know that this morning in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, a man opened fire and killed at least 10 people and others are wounded. And it seems that he targeted this particular synagogue because of its work with supporting refugees. So I want to hold these people in, and all people who are persecuted because of who others think they are today as, we, as I offer this prayer and also in memory of our beloved teacher, Father Thomas Keating. I know for many of you in this room, he was very dear and he, he died very gracefully the night before last. And he was one of my beloved teachers also, as you may notice, I'm all over the map. I am a, a Jew with a lifelong devotion to a Hindu guru and a, a Vipassana Buddhist meditation practice and some 15 initiation in three Sufi orders. <laughs> and I'm a translator of the Christian mystics. The Shekhinah is the indwelling feminine presence of the divine in the Jewish tradition. O oh Shekhinah, yours is the feminine face of the holy, the luminous moon who lights up the night as we travel from captivity to liberation, the pillar of fire who guides our way home, the cloud hovering over the mountain peaks, living sign that the drought is over. You are the indwelling feminine presence of the divine. Whenever we gather to praise the one, you are here in our midst. When we cry out for justice, you make our hearts tender. When we stand with those on the margins, you make our legs strong. When we create works of art and parent our children and harvest our gardens, you guide and sustain us. You are the Sabbath bride, the beloved, returned from exile. You restore balance in our relationships and wholeness to our fragmented souls. You infuse our lovemaking with honey. You fill the cup of our hearts that tremble with longing with the wine of your answering love. You are the song of our homecoming. You are the Sabbath queen, the great mother, who sits at the heart of the table, tearing off hunks of the secret bread that contains the exact flavor each of us loves best. You feed us all, the proud and the repentant, the believer and the skeptic, from your own hands. Your unconditional forgiveness dissolves otherness. O Shekhinah, we are the vessel of your inflowing. Your radiance requires the clay of our embodiment. Your flame burns at the core of the earth. Your warmth penetrates the seedbed and animates the seedlings. You bless the head of every animal and kiss the tear-streaked face of humanity. You are the vision that builds community and you are our refuge when community unravels. Be with us now 
as we navigate this landscape of mystery, where your most cherished attributes, wild mercy and boundless compassion, righteousness and wisdom seem to be cast aside and trampled by imperious world powers, and we are paralyzed by helplessness. Help us. May we remember you and lift you up. May we recognize your face and celebrate your beauty in everything and everyone, everywhere, always. Amen. So the way of the mystic is this combination of annihilation, annihilation of the illusion of the separate self, and embodiment of fully inhabiting exactly what is. And the feminine mystics of all spiritual traditions, who we barely know about because we didn't get to know about them, they were buried have been buried, are the ones who seem to so easily uh, recognize that there is no difference between transcendence and imminence, between uh, connecting with spirit and embodying all, all that is. Are we having a fire? Okay. Except in my heart. <laughs> So my first book was a translation of Dark Night of the Soul by John of the Cross, who was in many ways the, the ultimate um, non-dual Christian mystic, you know, along with Meister Eckhart and Angelus Silesius. Do you know Angelus Silesius? He's pretty obscure. Andrew Harvey's doing a new book on him um, now, but he's a beautiful apophatic mystic. Apophatic meaning the, the way of neti neti, of... of taking away all definitions and all concepts in order to arrive at absolute being, blah, blah, blah. I find I'm no longer that interested in neti neti. And um, stripping away, I've spent so much of my life in that effort to eliminate everything that felt like illusion in order to arrive at some kind of cold core of being. And it is indeed a cold pursuit for me. Um, and so only in the last few years as I'm growing older am I beginning to finally come back home to the body and to the embrace of the, ev the divine in every particle of embodied being. And so that has drawn me back to the women mystics of all spiritual traditions. So I'm skipping over all the non-dual stuff I, I was going to give you examples of and going, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> so I feel that um, the Adv Advaita Vedanta tradition and the Christian apophatic tradition have in some ways, in their effort to affirm the truth of non-duality, have become very dualistic. Have you noticed this? So that the devotional impulse in itself becomes uh, the object of derision sometimes, because the, the mystics are on fire with love for God and their hearts overflow with what? With longing. And so if you're coming from a very non-dual place, then longing itself seems like an inferior state of being. Like, what are you longing for? You already are it. There is no separation. And if we curtail that impulse, that hunger of the heart to reach out for the divine, then we are eliminating, we are discounting that which connects us with the divine, that portal itself is the heart's longing, or can be the heart's crying out in longing for union. And that 
creates union. When Rumi says, there is a secret medicine given only to those who hurt so hard they cannot hope, he goes on to say, the hopers would feel slighted if they knew. So the feminine, so where John of the Cross, my beloved John of the Cross, speaks of climbing the secret ladder of love, he's talking about getting up and out of this world so that he could have a secret rendezvous with the beloved in the garden. But what's in the way for the apophatic mystics, for the, for the vertical masculine mystics is this, the body with all of its messiness and its pesky little desires and neuroses and needs and emotions and feelings. But the feminine mystics invite us again and again to inhabit the very core of the human experience where we are so briefly getting to hang out. So the feminine is interested in embodiment, she is relational. Everywhere I go, everywhere I speak now, women, especially younger women, but women in general keep coming up to me with two things that they want to say. One is, will you help me? Because these things are happening to me, to my heart, and there's no language for it in, this, in these privileged, white-dominated, male-dominated spaces where we're gathering. I don't know what to do with it. And the other thing women are coming to me with is, let me help you, Mirabai. How can I help you fully uh, share what you have to share with the world? This is relational. The, the feminine experiences the pain of the world in the cells of her own body. And I'm not just talking about women. I'm talking about the feminine in each of us. So there is a blessing of the ordinary that is happening more and more as the feminine steps up. There is a, an affirmation of the holiness of beauty without any cause, without any reason, without any um, fix. That beauty is not here to fix anything that's broken, but beauty for the sake of beauty. There is a blessing of sexuality in the body and and the brokenness of the human condition. I'm going to uh, read you another prayer that I wrote in this book, Mother of God, Similar to Fire. That's the name of an ancient Eastern Orthodox icon. And this is a book I did in collaboration with uh, a, um, an iconographer priest, a, a Roman Catholic priest, Father Bill McNichols who asked me, as we've already established, a Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi, pagan, to write a prayer for each of, I can't find the page. Um, Vera, do you, you don't remember, do you? Each of the um, cries of the world. When you only have five minutes, seven actually, it's, I thought I'd marked it. It's okay, I'm gonna go on and I'll come back to it. Thank you. So, Mother Mary for me has become a great inspiration. Mary, I feel, was the quintessential prophet because when she was filled with the Holy Spirit, when she was called by the archangel to become the vessel for the incarnation of the absolute into the particular. Like any good prophet, her first impulse was, hell no, <laughs> you have the wrong girl. You couldn't possibly mean me, an unmarried, knocked up peasant. And her second response, after breathing into it, was, he neni, he neni. Here I am, use me. Not use me because I'm so great and worthy and I'm ready and pick me, but because I am broken and confused 
and willing and broken open and surrendered. I surrender. What else can I do? Thank you, Vera. So this prayer is to her and for her. Mother of God, she who hears the cries of the world is this icon. Like Kuan Yin, she who hears the cries of the world. Mother of mercy, the cries of the world keep me awake at night. I rise from my bed, but I cannot locate the source of the wailing. It is everywhere, Mother, coming from all directions, and my heart is shattered by the sheer intensity of suffering. You of boundless compassion, expand my heart so that I can contain the pain. Focus my mind so that I can arrive at viable solutions and energize my body so that I can engage in effective action. Give me the courage to follow the crumbs of heartbreak all the way home to the place where I can be of real service. Let me dip my fingers into the dew of your compassion and scatter it now over the fevered brow of this world. In the Holy Quran, the phrase that's uttered again and again is Bismillah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And Rahman and Rahim, the root of the word Rahim is, or maybe it's even the word so Arabic speakers can set me straight, is womb. So, Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim we begin in the name of God, who is mercy and compassion. Over and over again, it's a feminine word, Rahman. I think it is in Hebrew as well. Is the womb, Rahim. So there is this underlying um, understanding that it is, it is not by escaping the messiness and particularity of this place, but in fully inhabiting it that we find our connection with the holy and with each other, which is the same thing, and with the earth, which is the same thing. I'm going to read you one more poem. This is by Zaina Hashem Beck. Do any of you know her, a Lebanese poet? So the women mystics come in all shapes and sizes and eras. It's called Piano. Piano. Dear God, I heard the children of Yarmuk have eaten the tree birds. By this I mean, how are you? Dear God, do you have a piano? By this I mean the kind that licks your heart clean, the way the sun burns and brightens the sky, even after night raids. Dear God, do you wait? By this I mean hell here has a vestibule. In it, Aham plays the piano. He calls it the piano of the siege, calls it brother. By this he means even the dried pit of a song is country, is food now. Dear God, do you have streets? Here in the camps, we name our streets after the cities we've lost. By this I mean, we have heard the rivers of our cities call us like blind old women in empty living rooms. Dear God, I love you. By this I mean, do you have another name? By this I mean, there are armies who shout your name and burn houses and pianos. Come back. 
Dear God, yesterday I saw a fish flailing in the mouth of a seagull. For a moment, it seemed the bird was choking, the fish diving upward for air. By this I mean, do you see us dance? Leila Hashem back. So read poetry. Read poetry to your lover in bed. Read poetry to your children. Commit poetry to memory. Learn it by heart. And let poetry of the mystics break you open and bring you home to your own dear, messy, beloved, beautiful particularity. And through that, resting in the absolute manifested in the particular praise and praise and praise again. Thank you. Thank you.